Uh, Dartmouth, I want to note, was founded in an act of land and community theft that was predicated on a desire to educate Native American youth in both Christian and colonial Western ideology. The lands on which I work and am currently beaming to you uh, from were forcefully and through deceit appropriated from the Abenaki and other Algonquin people who nevertheless continue to live and work here. I also, oh, just kidding. There we go. Get that clicker there. There we go. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, that I'm here rather than with you all uh, in Michigan, in part because of our ongoing COVID crisis that has led to at least 714,706 deaths in the United States. This is the official tally from Johns Hopkins um, as of today. And I say at least because it's almost surely an undercount of, of rather significant proportion. Um, and this <clears throat> number is 60,000 more deaths than from our top 10 US wars combined, right? Um, so World War I, two, revolutionary civil, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, I think there are ways in which um, COVID can seem almost as if it's over. Recently, my mother suggested that very thing to me, um, or as if our new normal has sort of settled in. And yet I, I kind of want to highlight, um, especially as a person who professionally is tracking how we track the numbers, um, that we are still very much in the middle of a pandemic. So I've been um, recently reading Claire Wellesley Smith's Resilient Stitch in which she encourage us, encourages us all to think about new opportunities in our old work. She describes um, work, and she's thinking here of textiles, um, right, as slow stories that we can learn from and continually um, work with. And Wellesley Smith, as I was suggesting, is a, a textile artist who invites us to return to discarded scraps and unfinished business. She asks us to return to our past starts and consider what we might add, and I'm quoting her here, uh, in skill, in experience, and in memories to these surfaces. And what I plan to do today is to weave some of my own slow stories and hopefully create a bit of a collective vocabulary for work in and adjacent to digital humanities that I find particularly exciting. And perhaps I'll even be able to model a more generous method, generous methods being something that I know many of us here today have in common. I'm also going to be using this kind of first person historical narrative in part because it allows me to articulate where I know from um, a principle in women of color feminisms that's perhaps um, best or most recently articulated by Eugenia Zorowski's awesome pedagogical exercise of the same name. So I started doing digital humanities work while I was still a graduate student. I'd gone so far as to take a leave of absence from my graduate program to become the managing editor for the Women Writers Project, one of the oldest digital publishing efforts here in the United States. Now, I wrote a fairly traditional uh, dissertation. It wasn't a digital dissertation by any means, but I did push through the sort of disciplinary gatekeeping and my own, to be honest, kind of waning belief in the work of the professoriate by spending time in a very welcoming DH environment. And I did some of my first experiments in both analog and digital remediation at the time. I also uh, wrote a lot about the relationships, oh, sorry, I wanna go back actually, um, between um, aesthetic texts like poetry and those that purport to be non-aesthetic like mathematics and business receipts. And I'm realizing as I'm talking to you that um, my slides are a little bit out of order. So we'll go here and then forgive me when I have to jump back. Um, so writing about aesthetic and non-aesthetic texts. In Numbered Lives, this became a history of what Timothy Race called the aesthetic rationalism of the early modern period. Uh, it was a turn to the clean, clear, orderly aesthetics of the numerical table, which you see on the left side is a 1666, um, February 2nd uh, bill of mortality um, <clears throat> from England, right? And um, you've got not only uh, in the, the big sort of section there, deaths from lots of different um, causes, right? Aborted, age, um, consumption, convulsion, dropsy, um, drowned at, at a tower. Um, that seems like that was a particularly uh, unpleasant death. Um, but at the bottom, there's the running tally of um, the, the plagues uh, deaths. On the right hand side, you see a, a roughly contemporary, it's a little bit later, um, sort of woodcut of what it was like to live in early modern Europe during the plague. Um, we know from Samuel Pepys's diary, as well as uh, lots of other sort of recorded instances, in addition to art, right, that 
people were literally dead in the streets, right? Um, Peeps talks about coming home from dinner one night and having to climb over bodies in the dark um, in order to make sure that he didn't touch them. And so, you know, the, the, the aesthetic rationalism that race is, is drawing our attention to is the contrast of the, the relatively clean and minimalist um, numerical table, right, that has a rather orderly aesthetic as compared to what it would have been like to be in the, in the city itself or in any of the cities um, in, moder or in early modern Europe. Um, now, so this clean orderly aesthetics of the numerical table is an aesthetics that was embedded in textual practice and emerging scientism to such a degree that few have seen it as an aesthetics. Um, but I think we might productively think of it like the written version of modernism, right? Spare, hygienic, exhibiting a careful control of the natural world that won't be realized in non-numerate disciplines for uh, a century or more. So in 2008 or 9, I was in a contingent position teaching as a visiting fellow at Harvey Mudd College. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Harvey Mudd is a science and engineering focused liberal arts college that is part of the Claremont Consortium, um, where Kathleen and I were, were both working uh, in the sort of early part of the 2000s. Um, the consortium is located on the far eastern edge of Los Angeles County. And uh, I was you know, in an office that was a borrowed office there as a, a visitor. Um, I overheard at the time two male faculty members talking about the recent increase in admissions of women to HMC and the problems that it was generating according to one of the men in the conversation. In his estimation, the women were insufficiently trained in physics and maths and therefore really unqualified to be there. When the other man in the conversation brought up the historical and social problems, both in educating women and in assessing women's skills, the first man brushed him off with a dismissive quip that went something like this. Oh, right. I know. To help the women, we should be teaching the physics of bread baking or some other similar nonsense. <clears throat> the rest of the conversation was equally rage inducing, but I share this part today because it plays an important part in my own commitments to particularly embodied and perhaps even artisanal feminist methods. So jump ahead a couple of years and forgive me as I sort of move back and forth uh, in my slides. Jump ahead a couple of years and I'm across the street at Scripps College, also one of the Claremont Colleges, but this time it's the Women's College. I was in a bit more stable position in a tenure track position and had become really smitten with Kate McLean's work in sensory mapping, including this emotional tactile map, um, which gives a three dimensional shape to her feelings as she began her master's work. Now, I very much wanted to think about how we might map the affect of poetry thinking about creating three-dimensional objects that rendered individual readings of a particular piece of literature. And I'll be honest, I wanted to do it so we could throw it around the room at one another, with one another. Um, I was quite fond of this idea, right, of, of taking high literature um, and the rather serious study uh, of it and, and being able to sort of toss it around. Now, part of my interest was to move away from the argumentative essay as the only mode of scholarly engagement with written texts and to make visible to my students that inter interpretation is itself a creative act. I was also very keen to bring a sense of play and whimsy into my classroom and my scholarship. And finally, I wanted to find ways to engage with digital media and the affordances of DH that honored the pretty ferocious uh, feminist critique of empirical masculinist, um, masculinist knowledge that I had begun in graduate school. And, and that sort of a uh, ferocious feminist critique of um, a, a kind of patriarchal mode of thought um, had really intensified after my experience overhearing the conversation at Harvey Mudd. On the one hand, I was angry at the misogyny embedded in thinking that women, I don't even think this fellow had non-binary people on his radar, that women weren't suited to physics, and I was equally worked up about the disregard for artisanal and craft ways of knowing, which have been coded as feminine as part of a socio-political early modern project to valorize numbers and written text over affective and embodied ways of knowing. So there's this tension right between what has been socially coded as feminine, embodied, affective, um, perhaps uh, orally transmitted, um, right? And the its flip side, the masculine, right? Which was empirical based on observation, uh, uh, able to be transmitted through textual writing. And that sort of had its um, 
its its uh, avatar in those early modern numerical tables, right? And their their sort of clean clarity um, and that aesthetic rationalism. So while I was there, I worked a bit on some of these ideas. Um, and I'm gonna get myself over here again, uh, worked a bit on some of these ideas and I taught a lot, including on the history of women making science, both as authors and as objects. So objects like this anatomical Venus, which is on the right-hand side, um, which was created in the workshop of Clemente Sussini, and these midwifery dolls, which are on the left-hand side, uh, created by the French king's midwife, Marguerite de Couderay. These and other handmade objects represent a kind of pivot point in the history of women in maternal and fetal medicine. Both of these sets of models were created in the service of a developing masculinized profession of obstetrics, and they were created um, in the service of new certification practices for, the, for midwives, um, those uh, anatomical models on the left in particular. And midwives at the time were increasingly under the supervision um, of male doctors and medical fraternities in Western Europe. Now, these models also participate, in particular the anatomical Venus, in the long history of marking the childbearing body as other to the standard of the male body. And there's a way in which this history is one in which women's viscera becomes a site of masculinized knowledge, even as women themselves are restricted in their long herald practices of caring for the maternal body. And this is in part, right, because the, the viscera, the opening up of the female anatomy becomes a site for the male gaze, right, for um, objective empirical observation, and then its subsequent communication in written text. Now, embodied oral and communal knowledge was being discounted um, at, at the same time that it was sort of, as it was being discounted, it became necessary for new objects and practices like these anatomical dolls to be created so that male doctors could learn about a body that was positioned as innately other. I was teaching this material and I was also living a variety of experiences as in a body with a uterus. I conceived, grew and birthed two whole new humans, a kind of remarkable process to be totally honest, and I miscarried a third. While I won't get into my various experiences around childbearing, being a woman and having, uh, or sorry, being a woman and a worker, teacher and researcher, Suffice it to say that none of what I experienced lessened my commitment to explicitly feminist politics and knowledge making. And in fact, many of those experiences pushed me to consider anew how race, gender, sexuality, and disability are categories that cis white masculinity can leverage in order to limit and sequester the life, life opportunities of its purported others. So I spent a lot of time after I moved to Arizona State University um, in the company of makers. Um, makers and somatic practitioners, dancers, theater, performance artists, fabricators of all sorts. I was also spending a lot of time in the company of Sarah Kember and Johanna Zylinska's great book, Life After New Media. And one of the major arguments of their book is that media studies scholars should focus not on media objects per se, but rather on processes of mediation so that we can understand, and this is a quote from them, our being in and becoming with the technological world, end quote. Now, I'd been reading a great deal in feminist new materialist scholarship at the time. You can think of work by Karen Barad and Jane Bennett here. And Zylinska and Kember's work did a really wonderful job of modeling for me how one might think about processes of mediation rather than the objects. It also echoed, but helpfully expanded how I'd come to understand some of the history of science and texts in the early modern period through work by scholars like Lorraine Dastin, Catherine Park, Karen Newman, Tara Numadal, Ted Porter, and yes, even Bruno Latour and Michel Foucault. And I just want to note, um, there's a, a sort of interesting symmetry um, in, a, in that I started as a, an early modern scholar um, and am now, you know, working in the 21st century thinking about new materialisms insofar as Margaret Cavendish, who was a rather exuberant early modern materialist, um, is, is someone that I worked on, right, um, and think with, and she was one of our earliest science fiction writers in English. Um, I'll note that she's a really problematic character uh, in in terms of understanding feminisms today um, in that she was 
quite critical of her uh, fellow women, um, but she does sort of inhabit that space and was often ridiculed by the, the men um, in science at the time for believing that all matter was vital, right? So there's a, a way in which um, the, the thinking from the early modern period um, has taken on a, a new kind of life uh, in the 20th and 21st century. So as part of the Vibrant Lives project, um, I worked with Jessica Ryko on a couple of different pieces, each deploying haptics and interested in how we could communicate about data with participants and audiences. And you see here a couple of stills from um, a, a fall forward event um, under the, the heading of Vibrant Lives um, that was held at ASU in 2015. In this intermedia piece, we invited audience members to consider how much data they were shedding, shedding as in like skin shedding, right? Um, in their everyday use of handheld devices. And as you can see, it was a multi-layered and quite messy argument. Not only did the dancers enact a kind of trailing, um, the same kind of trailing that cookies and other small bits of embedded code do when we surf the internet, we also had costumes designed by Eileen Stanley that visualized and made tangible that shedding. So you can see there on the right, um, the, the coat is kind of um, crusted with uh, the orange dust. And on the left, you can see that various dancers dust from their outfits has sort of fallen onto the floor and then is being manipulated in the course of the improvisation. Um, in addition to scaffolded improvisational movement that articulated some of the data behaviors, audience members could hold small haptic devices that would transform outgoing packet data into vibrations, allowing them to feel the data coming off of a machine in real time. And we continued, uh, Jessica and I in particular, um, continued to work with these ideas in the vibrant data installation commissioned for the Spark Festival where large sculptures with bass, bass speakers embedded in them, um, which are amusingly called butt kicker speakers, um, created the haptic experience. So you see on the left, right, um, an audience member from the Spark Festival is laying down on the, the large sculpture and the speakers embedded in there um, are relaying essentially a song, right, um, that has been created from sort of in real time, uh, there's an algorithm behind this um, that Michael uh, in particular helped us work on, um, gathering the outgoing packet data from everyone in the installation's uh, cell phone or other um, connected devices. It's turning that into uh, a stream of numbers that is then being sort of written as a musical score that is then being played through the, um, the large speakers. And because it's a bass heavy score, um, people laying, touching, sitting on the sculptures can feel their data um, as it's sort of going off of their phones. Um, we then were thinking through um, the installation that's on the left that Kathleen mentioned in her introduction, right? Um, which is the living net. And that was launched uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia in 2015. And in that piece, we invited a community of feminist technologists and make feminist technologists and makers, um, part of the FemtechNet network, um, to contribute items from their junk drawers that could be woven into a large paracord net that also vibrated with small haptic devices. And so what you're seeing there is a, it's probably, 10 foot by 10 foot at least, um, paracord net. Jessica did the hand weaving for the large portion of the net. We then took that and did a kind of real time um, interactive installation of it so that we were, I was weaving while talking to people on the floor, sort of getting it to sort of attach to various um, parts of the, the space that it's in. And in addition, we were hand weaving in um, the small bits, right? So you can see in the lower right corner of the living net image, there's a, a, a notebook, there's a scarf, um, we have a discarded letter, we have a broken wooden spoon. So these were bits that had been left behind in people's drawers or discarded from years of use. And as a feminist intervention, we were wanting to think about how those bits from life, right, were not necessarily the kind of thing that were being captured and monetized, right? Um, these were sort of the detritus of everyday life um, that would eventually probably end up in a bin somewhere. Um, whereas our data, um, which is also 
being presented on the net. Our data is something that's being continually harvested and then sold by third party data brokers um, for, for significant um, money, right? I mean, there's a reason why um, there have been headlines uh, over the last 10 years about data is the new oil. And it's this idea, right, that people can use um, the data from people's devices and their internet habits um, in order to you know, make precision suggestions, do real-time um, pricing of, of items, um, do more communication and um, um, product awareness campaigns, right? Uh, and so we wanted to think about that contrast, right? The analog um, data shed, the analog shed that was not being monetized and the highly monetized but otherwise invisible um, digital shed. And just as a a uh, little bit of explanation, like the installation to the left, um, when people encountered the living net, the um, people in the room's cell phones or other wireless devices, if someone had an iPad or if they were using a computer, would connect to uh, an internet server um, that we interrupted with a Wireshark device. And we gathered everyone's outgoing packet data. We made sure that we weren't looking at the actual data. We were only looking at the volume of packet data um, in order to preserve privacy. So we were essentially routing it through in order to gather the numbers, right? And then again, taking those numbers, running them through an algorithm that would turn them into a song. That song was then played in the ambient space so you could hear the increase in traffic, but you would also feel it on the net because there were small haptic devices called woojers that were embedded all over in the net that would cause the net to vibrate as internet traffic increased or decreased. Um, now, around this time, I learned about uh, Kelly Dobson's phrase, uh, data visceralization. Um, and I continue to find it a useful way of describing some of what I do. And particularly in the case of the work that I was doing and continue to do around rendering data from archival collections, which I'll talk about in a minute. But just to, to read this for everyone, right, in contrast to data visualization, in which perspectival representations of data are arranged and optically received, data visceralization foregrounds information via translations that are physically experienced. And for me, this was a, a, a sort of thinking about the, the layers that are being added on, right? Um, this was a layer that was being added on from the critique of a kind of masculinist empiricist knowledge paradigm, right? Um, the, the dependence on the ocular, right, of, of sighted vision, of um, proof evidence, right, um, of, you know, pulling out the viscera of bodies in order to investigate them. Um, that was part of that shift in the 17th century to, uh, um, you know, the, the aesthetic rationalism and the new empiricism um, that we have all inherited, it to, inherited today. And so the Dobson's work thinking about visceralization as returning to physically experienced uh, ways of knowing felt to me like it was um, of a piece with some of those long trajectories. Now, in the uh, case of the archival collections, um, in particular, what you're seeing here are um, renderings of data from archival collections about human rights abuses, um, in which we were particularly concerned, and this is under um, a project that was first called Eugenic Rubicon and is now called Eugenic States. Um, that project is particularly interested in maintaining privacy. Um, and this work is done in collaboration um, with colleagues at the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab at the University of Michigan, um, which was founded by Alex, Alexandra Mina Stern, um, who is a historian of medicine who's written extensively on the history of eugenics. Um, so part of what we're doing, uh, or what I was doing um, in this particular set of images is taking uh, the 60,000 records from the state of California um, that Stern located. Um, and these records were recommending or commenting on the recommendations for eugenic sterilization um, in California between 1907 and I think 1962. Um, 
And part of what I was particularly concerned with was finding ways to create experiences that were shared, right, that were common. You can see on the left hand side, um, that's a talk that I gave at, at uh, the University of Kansas. Um, and people, you can't really see it, but people are, are touching a very thin um, red wire that runs the length of the, the set of people who are standing there. And that wire was again, attached to a haptic device um, that was playing a song um, that I created from the data that Alex um, and her team had been able to collect um, from these records. And among the things that I was interested in um, with this particular version was the ways in which uh, any person along the line of the wire had to be very careful. They had to have a very light touch because it wouldn't take much to dampen the signal down the line, right? So in order for everyone down the line to sort of feel the sonification of the data and the haptification of the data, people had to be present together on the right hand side and, and caring for one another, right? They had to be thinking about what information was being communicated and could it continue on to the next person. Similarly, um, on the right hand side, you have the same data set, same song essentially, um, that is being played through um, a haptic device. The haptic device is embedded in a, a small inflatable, right? Um, and everyone has their hands on there. And again, they, if they, if they rest too heavily, um, the signal will be dampened for some and not others. Although this is a much more centrally located signal than it was um, in the wire. And again, this is a kind of communal um, experience, right? Um, and in particular, what each of these um, groups is feeling is um, data that is parsed by age and gender. And the notes that are coming through particularly strongly, um, so they have been uh, lowered in the, the sonic register, um, are those of people under 18 who did not consent. Right. And so you have people who are over 18 and who either didn't or didn't did or did not consent. And then you have people who are under 18 and who did not consent. Um, and those are being played across a kind of sound range. And we were only able to get about a year's worth of data here in these demonstrations um, just because it, it produces a rather large file. All right. So jump ahead now. Um, it's 2018. I have moved to Dartmouth and as Kathleen said, I'm the director of something called the Digital Humanities and Social Engagement Cluster. I've also fallen madly in love uh, with this particular piece on the bottom right corner um, by Sheila Hicks. And now I'm thinking about cascades of textiles along with thinking about rendering data as vibration and sound. And true to my interest in participation and sensory engagement, I'm quite annoyed um, when I go to visit this piece at MoMA um, that one is not supposed to touch fine art pieces, right? So it's this exquisitely beautiful cascade of these really glorious fibers that just, in my opinion, sort of want to be, they call out to be touched, um, but you're not supposed to touch it. Um, at the same time, and I've got a couple other examples um, that were sort of visual inspirations. I haven't seen the other three in person though. Um, I'm also increasingly uncomfortable uh, with the energy costs of big data cultures, right? So I've, I've moved up here, um, I'm thinking about big data, I'm responsible in some ways for sort of ushering in uh, new conversations and continuing previous relationships and conversations about digital humanities and social engagement. Um, but I'm worried, right, about um, what you'll see me describe here uh, or quote um, uh, the extractive economy um, that digital and data cultures participate in. And I'm thinking about how we can make the climate crisis matter to people who are also interested in data visualization and uh, representation. And so, uh, Predoctoral fellow and uh, digital lab manager Nikki Stevens and I propose a piece entitled Energy Pools, um, which was commissioned by the Irving Institute for Energy Futures here at Dartmouth. And we designed the piece to be part of an interactive installation um, that was to be held in Hanover in the spring of 2019. And the idea, there was a big international conference, it was bringing together people from across industry and academia to think about energy futures um, here in Hanover. And the idea was that the piece would be up for the full three days of the conference and that conference attendees would help enact the energy transition that I'm going to show you eventually takes place here. Um, and that energy transition that's represented in this piece 
is derived from the target that the US would need to reach in order to be in line with the IPCC's 2030 goal of capping global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, you know, we're living now still in the long 2019. We all know how the spring of 2019 went. Uh, the conference was uh, canceled and the installation obviously couldn't take place um, in, you know, everyone, everyone went home, um, essentially. The piece, I had begun to build it um, in the lab with Nikki and along with um, a couple of undergraduate students who I'll introduce you to in just a minute. Um, but even that work had to stop. And so the piece sat um, for a long time while we all were home um, with COVID, not actually having COVID, but home due to COVID. Um, eventually, we're able to get back together again. Um, I'm working with a, a student. Um, oh, where did, why did her name just run away from me? Caroline. Uh, Caroline Casey, um, who had been in several of my classes and was an employee at the Digital Justice Lab. Um, we've been working and we're hanging, furiously hanging things um, while in masks, et cetera. And what you have here in front of you uh, is the energy pool's initial state. Um, so this is a piece that's about eight foot by four foot wide, and it's actually um, uh, three-dimensional, uh, right? So it, it extends back four feet and there's another side, um, which is what you see in the bottom right corner. Um, as an aside, I've learned a lot about how to do really good documentation, um, mostly from my failures. Uh, so you see we've got pictures with uh, other equipment, et cetera, in there, um, but we're getting better at it. Um, so in its initial state, what this piece does is it visualizes energy usage in the United States in 2018 by source. Now, the US used 101.3 quadrillion BTUs in 2018. And the quadrillion BTUs are what the sort of industry professionals refer to as quads. And that's a unit of energy for, for understanding large scale energy consumption. And that's across all sectors uh, in the United States. And each quad is here represented by 10 strands of fabric. So there are, or, or textile material. Um, so there are 1,013 strands in total. Um, and they all are sourced um, from women-owned businesses. And they all are either recycled materials or come from renewable resources. So some of them are recycled um, chiffon and sari silk, sorry silk materials um, that were part of the um, uh, sort of like the remnants um, from garment production and others of them are um, the what's known as roving right so you gather the wool you comb it you clean it etc and before you spin it into something like a yarn or a string um, it's this amazingly fluffy delightful to touch uh, material known as as roving um, and so We've got this, this piece, right, that is attempting to think through energy transition. It's using um, renewable or recycled materials, and it's sort of thinking about uplift of small um, women-owned businesses uh, in particular. And part of what it is designed to do, as I had suggested, is, is be transformed, right? And since we couldn't do the installation as we had imagined in public, and even when we got around to doing this, we weren't able to do it um, in public with students because it would have brought too many students together. I was able to get a small set of students um, to come into the lab, um, masked, vaccinated, uh, et cetera, um, and to work on it together. And so they did the labor of the energy transformation. Now, this allows us to see the transformation that I'm going to show you in just a minute, but what it didn't do, right, was it didn't embed the kind of um, physical memory of having to do the work of energy transitions in the people who were sort of stakeholders in the way that I wanted it to. Um, but our students certainly had uh, that experience in their bodies. They spent hours, um, and I was there along with them, braiding out um, the different energy sources in order to bring forward uh, renewable energy. So I should pause real quick and tell you that um, what you see along the front uh, quarter there is um, a kind of black-red um, color scheme that represented um, petroleum. You've got um, the blues, which are representing natural gas. On the back side, you had greens, which represented renewable. 
Around the corner to the right, which you can't see, are some reds and oranges, which represent nuclear energy. And there's a small band of gray at the back that represents coal energy. And so um, you have each source of energy, right, has its appropriate number of strings based on the percentage um, that it contributes to our total US energy consumption. So on the left, you can see sort of where we started. 2018, we had only 14% renewables. Um, and on the right, you see after the braiding work has been done, the students have pulled forward um, renewables such that they constitute 49% of the energy and they have braided back um, the uh, petroleum and natural gas um, based on those IPCC recommendations. Um, so you've got, uh, you know, it's sort of pulled back um, the deprecated energy sources and pulled forward um, what we'll need to see in the future. I think you can see there's a pretty significant transition. And I'll note that um, most of the US and international um, studies on how the US can achieve this IPCC goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius has almost all of the change coming from gas and petroleum sources, um, which is why you see it really prominently there. So that's our team. Uh, who helped us both create and enact um, and then also document um, the uh, energy pools piece. All right, so now what I want to do is take us to some of where I'm thinking today, right? So we've sort of moved from the 2008 up forward uh, through time with just some, not all, um, of the, the different engagements that I um, have been participating in around these topics of, of data representation and visceralization. Um, and I wanna sort of bring us together to think about um, some work by Hannah Musol, Bethany Nowitzki, uh, Nana bond Thilstrup, and some others here in a moment. Um, Hannah Musol has a 2021 DHQ piece titled Beyond the Word. And I think um, if you haven't read it, I really recommend that you do, it's great. Um, and it does a really great job of sort of talking through much of what I think I and my collaborators have found over the last seven or eight years. Um, that there's room for and perhaps even a need for digital and data engagements that encourage multi-sensory experience and that do not, and I'm going to quote um, Musol here, do not privilege ocular or monolingual or textual proficiency. And Musol goes on to note that this was important in her own experience um, for community members um, who were not fluent in English, um, or in her case, uh, Norwegian, um, and also for neurodiverse participants with different narrative preferences and digital or physical access needs. So I think there's a, a kind of interesting convergence, right, both in terms of um, thinking through differently accessible information and also thinking through how to disrupt a certain dominant paradigm of knowing, right? That those two things might go hand in hand. And Musil, reflecting in her piece, um, notes that people who came into her installations, and I'm um, quoting her again, were temporarily taken aback by the force of sensory affects and disciplinary border crossings. Participants soon found that the techno biologist, biologist but my goodness, biologist poetic exchanges of affects and capacities between human bodies, machines, plants, animals, and archives was both very visceral and meaningful. Um, and she continues, many were literally and metaphorically touched by, for instance, how intertwined literature, digital art, and biology are. And I think for me, this is really important, right? This notion of being touched by something, but not simply touched by something for the sake of being touched by something, but so that it matters um, and matters to a person at a kind of um, a, a level that it might not have otherwise. One of the participants in the KU talk um, with the long red thread um, offered me the feedback, right? That she felt more implicated 
um, in the history of eugenics because she could feel it in her body, right? Um, that she had a, a kind of sensory memory of the, the eugenic records vibrating along um, that strand. And that that meant that she needed to pay attention in ways that she hadn't felt as implicated for um, when it had been a data visualization, right? A graph or a representation of the numbers. And I think there's something interesting there um, that's worth paying attention to. Musol also notes that um, her installations, and I'm quoting her again here, activated an embodied historical fleshy archival sensorium. They foregrounded multi-purpose and multimodal affordances of the digital and analog technology, and they revealed the critical force of affect produced by immersive visual sound and digital tools. And that critical force of affect, I think, is something um, worth paying attention to. And the, the, it sort of resides for me in the possibility of what Jamie Sky Bianco has described as creative critique. And I think we see this idea of creative critique, right? Um, and the, the sort of multi-sensorial space, right? Um, echoed in Sadia Hartman's critical fabulations, um, a term that later gets picked up um, by the design scholar Daniela Rosner in her book by the same title, um, Critical Fabulations. So I think there's something both about um, the, the place of speculative, creative work in critique, Right, and also the importance of multimodal and perhaps even immersive um, sort of knowledge transfer, right, as opposed to something where we sort of sit and simply receive. Now, I closed uh, the book Numbered Lives with a call to, and I'm quoting myself here, uh, to rematerialize data, to make it into something that one can touch, feel, own, give, share, and spend time with. We can leverage quantum mediation to make media with texture, sound, color, heft, weight, and length. Media that I hope, I'm, you know, this is still speculative for me in many ways, but I think that can begin to grapple with the end dimensionality of human experience. Now, Musol articulates it in another way that I think speaks to the new materialist and echo critical bent in much of the work by which I've been inspired. And I'm quoting Musol again here. Critical design and mixed media art practices already tackle the human machine interaction through the lens of critical theory and art, often literate and performance arts, and engage with ethics, reflection, social critique, and the speech of the body as foundational, not peripheral components of knowledge making. And I think that's a really critical element. And I would argue that it's critical even in our understanding of the internet itself, right? Um, uh, Marisol, uh, Musial, Musial, sorry, is um, citing Mauro Floyd's um, notion of performing the internet. And I think a lot about um, like Nicole Starlewski's uh, sort of materialist history of the internet and thinking about how critical it is that we find a way to sort of crack open the black boxing of both digital and data culture so that we can sort of get at its guts in a way um, that would allow us to understand it um, differently. Now, um, I think this notion of performance is also really critical and I'm gonna get into it in a minute. I just wanna again quote um, Musial because I, the piece is, it was really useful for me, obviously. Um, she talks about um, non-deterministic disobedient use of digital tools. And I think this is, um, you know, there's a, a tenet in uh, European feminism in particular that thinks about um, being undisciplined, right? Um, but this idea of non-deterministic disobedient use of digital tools, shifting us away from, you know, a sort of plain use of digital tools and instead towards bio-digital, speculative, immersive, reflective performance. Um, right, something that would allow us to imagine and co-create other models, non-corporate models, perhaps non-extractive models, I would hope, right, of embodied, um, you know, becoming with our media uh, to return to uh, Kember and Zelenska's um, words. Now, this is the part of the talk where my relatively careful weaving stops. <laughs> 
and we simply follow a few threads that are part of where I hope some of my next work will go. One of the things that I was um, sort of thinking about as I was getting ready for this talk is, you know, because she's a textile artist, uh, that the notion, right, of a slow story is about adding to surfaces, right? Um, but I want us to think about a slow story that considers what surfaces already know or what textiles already know. Um, you've got on your left um, a NASA developed textile um, that can, um, it's programmable. Um, it looks an awful lot like the um, programmable or the woven memory core that actually flew um, the first space missions, um, which if you haven't read about, I, I highly recommend um, Rosner's work on that. Uh, in the middle there is a, a smart textile that is activated by heat, right? It, it is flat initially, and as the temperature goes up, it, it returns to a particular shape. And on the right are some images of experiments of programmable coiling um, in particular strands of uh, uh, engineered textile. So I want to think about what surfaces, what what textiles, what materials, surfaces might already know, um, but not just in smart textiles, right? Um, 2018 ASU's uh, Emerge Festival included. Um, this edible skin piece, and I have left off the name of the artist, and so I will find that for you. I know her first name is Allie. Um, but what she's wearing there is a fungus shirt, right? Um, and thinking about what it means to be able to create, she's particularly interested in how you create um, sustainable fashion um, in a world that has uh, sort of favored fast fashion. But thinking about, right, um, if you're growing a fungus shirt, um, you know, one of the things that we have begun to learn from our friends in ecology um, and uh, sort of mushroom studies, we might call it, uh, is the, the amount of information that is being passed through fungi in our world. Um, and so we might think about the information that's already encoded there. I've also been really inspired by a project that was started by Magda Tilzik Carver, and I hope I got that name right, um, under the heading fermenting data. Um, and I'll read this for you here. Fermenting data is a speculation on how data practices could be different. Rather than staying with the dominant data processing models based on capture, extraction, and surveillance, we take inspiration from symbiotic relations between microbes, plants, and human cultures related to food processing and preservation to intervene and invent fermenting data practices. And what you see here uh, on the sides are pieces by uh, Cecil Marie Tone on both the top and bottom and Matthew Giacomi. Um, so you've got a, a data visualization in a kind of mucosal form there in the middle. Um, he's mapping a city. Um, and Cecil Marie Tone's pieces are actually photogrammetry of bodies, human bodies that have been found in bogs um, in the Netherlands. And she is taking the photogrammetry from those bog bodies currently held in museums in the Netherlands and thinking about how to transform those into um, mixed media installations that get us to think about temporality, um, mortality, right? The, the kind of metadata embedded in, in, in this case, non-fermenting um, uh, materials. Um, but I think there's something really interesting going on um, with these kinds of uh, explorations. And here um, on the left-hand side is a, a sort of, um, it's, a, it's a design thinking piece, right? Um, from the fermenting data workshop where the group gathered together to literally share their fermented foods. So they ate, they were in company together, um, but then they also used those same things to create new sort of knowledge um, maps to think about new design opportunities, et cetera. So they're, they're eating, they're ingesting, um, they're sharing in a community and also they're, they're creating things on paper um, from this kind of common experience. And there's something for me, I've been um, lately rather fixated on um, work from the Fluxus movement. And for those of you who don't know, this is 50s, 60s, kind of a, a loose affiliation um, of folks. And they often, the Fluxus movement practitioners were often thinking about how to resist kind of um, 
high art, high academic culture, they produced what they called scores, right? Scores for performances that are these very minimal directions, but they remind me very much of improvisational scaffolding um, from my conversations with my dance and somatic um, collaborators. And here you've got um, Alison Knowles, um, her, she is a member of the Fluxus movement. Um, she's still relatively active. Um, her proposition, Make a Salad, was quite famous in 1962 when she first um, launched it. And here she is again uh, in 2012. Um, and she did a piece um, even after this that was again um, proposition making a salad um, on the High Line in New York. And I think there's something interesting um, in attending to the kind of everyday mundane practices and for Knowles, right, there's attending to the sounds, right, the sound of the chopping, the sound of the um, dropping of radishes, the sound of people putting things together. And you'll note that in Knowles' piece, um, at least in that top right uh, 1962 piece, it's, it's largely feminized labor, right? Um, it's mostly women doing the work. And so thinking about that as a kind of critical creative practice um, that has a score, right? It's like, get some vegetables, get a group, make a salad. Um, that to me is, um, it, it strikes me as an interesting jumping off point. Um, so some other things that I've been thinking of because I think about memory and counting, um, Weavings of War was a exhibition um, that came through in Connecticut um, that gathered um, weavings out of uh, major human strife and uh, war from a range of different um, groups and ethnicities um, and time periods. Um, on the right hand side, you have um, Shiota's Beyond Memory, um, which does this amazing job of weaving together again, um, large memory pieces thinking about um, more traditional paper forms um, alongside the installation form. And then, you know, sort of thinking about these fleshy, fibrous ways of knowing. Um, so on the left, you have um, improvisational contact dance. On the bottom left, you have Nora Zangina um, Shaw's synchronous objects, thinking about what is it that bodies in motion know? What does, what does the muscle know? What does the, the interaction between the human know? And on the right, you have a rendering, a 3D rendering of tree roots um, surrounded by a network of fungi. Um, there's a book called The Wood Wide Web, right? Um, that's thinking about how um, microbial fungi uh, are communicating on behalf of a forest ecology um, in ways that I think are really interesting. I don't yet know where I'm going um, with thinking that these are interesting, but I find them provocative. And this provocative thinking um, has most recently taken uh, shape in a, a proposal called Flesh, Fiber, and Information. And this is with Rami Ron Morrison, Theodora Dyer, Sydney Skybetter, and Molly Morin. And I'll just read this real quickly for you. Um, we're almost at the end here. Um, we are interested in articulating the information already embedded in fleshy, fibrous ways of knowing, right? So pivoting a little bit from that, like what can we communicate across fibers to what is already embedded in fibers, encoded in fibers. We are inspired by Diana Taylor's call to see embodied performance as a quote, system of learning, storing and transmitting knowledge and her methodological model that resists the tendency to quote, reduce gestures and embodied practices to narrative description. Now, historically written information has been elevated as we've been talking about um, as part of privileging white Western and patriarchal forms of knowledge over racialized and feminized embodied practices. This project instead follows the poet uh, Joy Harjo's observation that there is more that you can't see, can't hear, can't know except in moments steadily growing and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. And that takes me to the end um, for today. As, as I suggested, it sort of leaves us with these tendrils um, yet to be woven, um, but I hope that they are um, productive tendrils for your future thinking. Thank you.